Y'all's about to go down. I said y'all's about to go down. I said y'all it's about to go down! There we go. What's going on? What's going on? Welcome to a special broadcast, Urban Health Outreach Media. I am your host, Steve Belcher. Tonight, we got a great topic that I'm going to talk about, especially if you're on kidney dialysis or you deal with chronic kidney disease. I'm going to be talking about potassium. Now, I know there's a lot of kidney warriors that are on dialysis right now that have trouble with their potassium levels. In fact, potassium can kill you, okay? I've known warriors on dialysis, God bless their soul, that their potassium level was nine, 10, and had a heart attack. So this is something that we need to talk about, and we're gonna do it right now. Again, potassium, tips for people with chronic kidney disease. So what is potassium? What is potassium? You hear about this all the time. Watch your potassium level. We got to enjoy your potassium. Uh, you're on the 2K potassium bath. You're on the 3K potassium bath. What does all this mean, especially if you just started in dialysis? So this is what we know. Potassium is a mineral that helps your nerves and muscles work right away. Now, if this mineral helps your nerves and muscles, of course it's going to affect the heart, all right? So that's why they say if you have an elevated potassium level, you may have say K, K level, you're at risk for cardiac arrest, okay? Why is potassium important for people with CKD? And before I say that, please share this broadcast. Other warriors need to, to see this, to get this education, and they may not be aware. Tag your friends if they're on dialysis, tag their loved ones. If they have someone on dialysis, we need to get this information out there, all right? So again, why is potassium important for people with chronic kidney disease? I'm going to tell you why. In some people with chronic kidney disease, the kidneys may not remove the extra potassium from the blood. So if you're kid, if you're in uh, uh, any one of the stages, let's say uh, kidney disease, uh, four, five, or even on dialysis. If your kidneys are not working at 100%, they're not going to be able to clear the extra potassium that you may be ingesting, right? Some medicines can also raise your potassium level. Your food choices can help you lower your potassium level. So you see how all this works together? How do you know if your potassium is high? I want to tell you that. This is very important. People often do not feel any different when their potassium is high. Your healthcare provider will check the level of potassium in your blood and the medicines you take. The level of potassium in your blood should be between 
3.5 and 5. Again, the levels of your potassium should be 3.5 to 5. Now, some people may experience uh, tingling in their hands. Uh, they may feel different. They may get a rapid heartbeat if their potassium is up. But that's nothing to play around with. Seriously. Now, how do I lower potassium in my diet? You've heard people talk about they love potatoes. And they got to soak them overnight to get the potassium out. Well, let me tell you. If you eat smaller portions of foods high in protein at meals and for snacks, meat, poultry, fish, beans, dairy, and nuts, you can use spices and herbs in cooking and at the table. Salt substitutes often contain potassium and should not be used. Let me repeat that. Salt substitutes often contain potassium and should not be used. Potassium chloride can be used in place of salt and in some packaged foods like canned soups and tomato products. Limit foods with potassium chloride on the ingredients list. You also want to drain canned fruits and vegetables before eating. So say some of you, now I know a lot of people out there shop at the dollar store, dollar general, general dollar, however you want to call it, or supermarket and get canned fruit. Well, instead of dumping Right, you take it out the can and dump it in a bowl with all the syrup. Drain that syrup, right? Drain the syrup before you dump it, and then you just have the fruit. Guys, also subscribe to our YouTube channel, Urban Health Outreach Media. A lot of great broadcasters on there for kidney disease information for warriors. A lot of great interviews with professionals, with patients who have had transplant, who are on dialysis, thriving. Uh, if you deal with kidney disease and this just happened to you, go to our YouTube channel and go through the archives of videos. I guarantee you, you won't be uh, disappointed. Now, if you have diabetes, this is very important. If you have diabetes, Choose apple, grape, or cranberry juice when your blood sugar goes down. Okay, let me repeat that. If you have diabetes, choose an apple, grape, or cranberry juice when your blood sugar goes down. And here's why. You don't want to, you know, a lot of people go with the hard candy, uh, the orange juice shots. You don't want to get that quick. I mean, if, if you have to use that, if you don't have anything else, yes. But if you're mindful and it, if you're diabetic and you're at risk for your blood sugar dropping, right? If you know that, get some apples. If you like apples, cut them up into slices. If you like grapes, bring them, put them in the container. Bring a little uh, eight-ounce container of cranberry juice, right? Take it with you. And then if something happens, you feel your blood sugar going down. Maybe you want to take your uh, glucometer with you so you can check your sugar. Goes down, boom. Me and some grapes. You ain't got to get that candy bar and, and shoot your blood sugar, skyrocket up, right? And then crash back down. That's not the smart way to do it. Those days are over with, right? Because things like that have your blood sugar 
bouncing like a seesaw up and down and you can't control it. It's all about the diet, some medication, but at the end of the day, you want to eradicate or get rid of the medication and go solely if you can. Some people, it got to the point where they have to use medication, but you want to play it smart. If you if that's your case, you want to incorporate exercise, water, eating right. I mean, you want to incorporate all this so you don't go down the road to kidney disease. Again, diabetes is the leading cause. If you didn't know that, the leading cause of kidney failure with hypertension coming in second. So let me give you, these are some suggestions, right? Again, go to and subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, Urban Health Outreach Media. Appreciate that. So look, try this. Eat these foods instead of these foods. So again, if this is if you're diabetic or if you got chronic kidney disease, okay? Eat white rice instead of brown and wild rice. White bread and pasta instead of whole wheat pasta and bread. Cook rice and wheat cereal instead of brown cereals. And then rice milk, not enriched, instead of cow's milk. All right. How do I lower my potassium in my diet? We're going to continue this. Choose fruits and vegetables that are lower in potassium, right? Have very small portions. You don't have to eat a lot. Small portions of foods that are higher in potassium. A lot of people say, oh, 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 I can't eat this because they say it's potassium. Well, just chop it down into small portions. There you go. You don't have to eliminate it. You got to play it smart. That's where mindfulness comes in. You, some of these foods you don't have to eliminate. It's cutting them, chopping them down into small portions and eating them. Not being greedy and have the whole meal but chopping it down in the smaller meals, right? Like one slice of tomato on a sandwich, a few slices of bananas on cereal. If you like bananas, right? Instead of eating a whole damn banana, right? Cut it in half, cut a couple of slices and throw it on the cereal. It, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, right, to do that. Thus, you're able to have your cake and eat it too. That's basically it. Cutting it down to smaller slices. Or half of an orange. Instead of eating a whole orange, a half an orange or a slice of orange, a quarter. But you don't have to eat the whole orange. You have a quarter for the day or half today and say the other half for tomorrow. Delay that instant gratification because that's what it is at the end of the day. Instant gratification. If you know that these foods that you like are high in potassium. Why eat the whole thing when you can just eat slices or not eat the whole thing, still enjoy it, and still be safe with your potassium levels? Okay, fruits and vegetables lower in potassium. What I'm about to name off these fruits and vegetables, 
They are lower in potassium. They have 200 milligrams or less. Um, and there is a, a asterisk behind the 200 milligrams or less. So I have to read that uh, asterisk um, uh, information. It says potassium level is based on one serving. One serving of fruit is one small piece, a half cup fresh, canned or cooked fruit, one fourth cup dried fruit, or a half cup juice. One serving of vegetables is a half cup fresh or cooked vegetables, one cup raw leafy, leafy vegetables, or one half cup juice. So here we go, fruits and vegetables. Now look, this list is, is not all inclusive. There's a lot of other foods out there, right? But this information is from the National Kidney Disease education program or the feds which comes under the department of health and human services uh the national institute of diabetes and digestive and kidney diseases now these are the fruits and vegetables that are lower in potassium at 200 milligrams or less which is based on one serving Apples, apple juice, apple sauce, apricots canned, apricot nectar, berries, cranberry juice, fruit cocktail, grapes, grape juice, grapefruit, grapefruit juice, honeydew melon, lemons and limes, mangoes, papaya pears, peaches, plums, pineapple, root, rhubarb, tangerines, and watermelon. Here are the vegetables. Alfalfa sprouts. I know a lot of people are probably like, damn, Steve, alfalfa sprouts. But yeah, alfalfa sprouts, bell peppers, Bamboo shoots, canned, broccoli, fresh, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower. I love cauliflower. Celery and onions, raw, corn, cucumber, eggplant. Eggplants is good. Green beans, kale, lettuce, mushrooms fresh. I love mushrooms. Okra. Summer squash cooked. Now, these fruits and vegetables are high in potassium. Again, this is not an all inclusive list, right? Because there's other um, fruits and vegetables that are high. So, here are the fruits that are high in potassium more than 200 milligrams. Apricot, mm, apricot. <laughs> Apricots fresh, bananas, bananas is a no-no, cantaloupe, dates, nectarines, kiwi, prune, prune juice, oranges, orange juice, raisins. So if you like orange juice and you be having that in the morning, like, like especially before you come to dialysis, on a, on a day that you have labs and your labs come back and you have high potassium, uh, you may want to look at that because that potassium based on that day doesn't like give you a, a summary of the whole month. So if, if, if they have lab, which is normally the first week of the month in most uh, large dialysis units, that morning, if you have something that's high in potassium, like bananas, a cantaloupe, some dates, nectarines, kiwi, orange juice, like you went to McDonald's and had some orange juice or raisins or some other things 
it, this list can go on and on. Then you got to look back if your labs come back and they say your potassium is high. You got to look back and see what you ate on that day that they drew those labs. So keep that in mind. These are the vegetables that are high in potassium. Acorn and butternut squash, avocado, baked beans, beet and other greens, broccoli cooked. And you see the other one that was low, they had broccoli fresh. But if you cook the broccoli, then it increases the potassium. That is something. Brussels sprouts cooked charred chili peppers mushrooms cooked so if you like mushrooms if you eat them fresh you can still have them but the problem come into play if you cook them just like with um broccoli potatoes pumpkin spinach cooked right Split peas, lentils, beans, sweet potatoes, yams, vegetable juice, tomatoes, tomato juice, and tomato sauce. So, guys, let me see. I got a lot of comments. Let me go down and answer the comments before ending the educational broadcast. I hope you guys got something out of this if you need clarification let me see hey kathy kathy says she doesn't like raw mushrooms <laughs> i hear you at, at one time i didn't like raw mushrooms but they're good if you uh put some uh dressing on it or some uh uh balsamic uh vinegar um that definitely brings out or enhances the flavor I found that out. Um, Kathy loved carrots, asparagus, eggplants, uh, green beans, must absolutely. Uh, oh, you said you don't like raw mushrooms as well. I understand. Um, I saw something from one of our uh, contributing correspondents, uh, Don. P. Elwood says, and always be mindful of your monthly lab values. If potassium is running high, limit or avoid higher potassium foods until the levels go down. And, and, and that's true. And you also got to look at what you're eating. Very, very important. Uh, Kathy also says that she can't eat grapefruits after the transplant. Wow. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's considered a star product or something. I think it's the uh, the uh, ingredient that's in that grapefruit. Yeah. Uh, let's see who else. Oh, okay, Kathy. Oh, hey, all right, Don. Don says teach. Thanks, Don, for coming in. Uh, thanks, Kathy, for uh, contributing. Also, Don, thanks for contributing. Uh, if anybody has any, uh, oh, hey, Mrs. Mayweather, God bless you. Thank you for uh, tuning in. I appreciate it. Um, and who else? Uh, pretty much. Uh, oh, Sabrina, what's going on? I hope everything is going extremely well with you. Thanks for tuning in. What's that behind that? A police officer. Oh, my God. She got a police officer behind her name. We got to watch out. We got to keep it clean. <laughs> All right. Thanks for tuning in, Sabrina. Appreciate the support. God bless you. Um, who else is here? Uh, and that's really about it. I definitely wanted to do another topic. Um, hmm. I will have to leave and go get it. If y'all want it, another topic, come on. I mean, give me some thumbs up. If not, I'll close it down and go work on the documentary. Get some ideas off of uh, YouTube. Any thumbs up? Any Anybody want another topic? I got uh, phosphorus. I can go get it just as a step away. 
So I tell you what, it's 26 minutes. I do another 15 minutes. I'm going to go get the information. If y'all leave, then you just leave. If you stay, then I know you want to, um, you know, want me to continue on. So let me give you, take a couple of seconds to go get this and I'll entertain you for a moment. going on with your access or PD catheter and you think you may have the flu, but it could be an infection. So let's talk about how to minimize the risk. An infection can feel like the flu. I swear it can. If your access get infected, right, God forbid, it can feel like a terrible flu with fever, right? Chills, nausea, vomiting, body aches, diarrhea. How many people experience that? The infection may prevent you from getting dialysis through your access. How many people had to get their access removed because it became infected? Whether it's a PD catheter or a grab or a catheter up in your neck. How many warriors watching this broadcast or you know someone had to get their catheter or their um, um, access removed due to an infection? I've seen it. It happens. 
So, also, if you're on a transplant list, do you think they're going to let you get a transplant if you have an infection brewing around? And if you go to the hospital, right, this infection can even require a long hospital stay until you get healthy. We all know germs can get into your body through your access, right? Because you got to hold wherever your access is, even if it's in your arm, they have to stick the needle in to get in there. And once that opening is created, that's how germs get into your bloodstream or affect your graft, right? This this can kill you. And I don't want to say this to scare you, but I want I want to um, say it like that because I want people to be mindful um, what they touch, especially when you go to the dialysis center, right? When you're going into the bathroom at the dialysis center. A lot of people don't always wash their hands. And you're touching the doorknob when you're coming in the facility, when you're leaving the facility, when you're going into the bathroom, when you're leaving out of the bathroom, when you're going in the treatment area, when you're leaving out of the treatment area. If you're in a large unit, do you know how many people touch that door? That's not even taken into account the staff that opens the door or use their dirty gloves to open the door. A lot of people are not thinking like this. Germs are everywhere, especially in the dialysis unit. You got people, right? You got people who actually sit in a chair, take off their shoes, in socks, right? Especially in the summertime, you're wearing flip-flops. Take off their sh shoes and step on a dirty scale or walk on the dirty floor from the chair to the scale with no shoes on. Come on, guys. That floor is, is so dirty. I cannot describe people who walk across that floor. You don't know if they got dog poop on the bottom of their shoe, where they've been walking. People have been walking throughout the hospital, uh, staff coming back. I, I mean, it's ridiculous. So think about this. If you're watching this and if you're on dialysis, and they want you to take off your shoes to get on the scale, right? You ask them for chucks, one of them blue pads to put on the scale to step on. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I do not get caught up in uh, little comfort things that can cause you to get an infection, right? Comfort things like taking off your shoes and walking across that dirty floor, not being mindful of maybe having some gloves on in the unit, right? When you open the door to leave out, get a pair of gloves and open the door, leaving out, open the door. If you got to go to the bathroom, have that glove on, right? And, and use the hand sanitizer. Use that that get out, use the glove that you use before, not the glove you use to hold your access site. And I'm hoping when you hold your access site, you are wearing a pair of gloves, but I'm not talking about those gloves. I'm talking about after you hold your site and you get bandaged up, you wash your hands for 30 seconds with soap and water, right? And when you leave the unit, Get a pair of gloves, a clean pair of the box. You may see them on the walls, right on the counter. Get a pair, put them on, open the door, leave out, open the door to go out of the whole facility, out of the building. Take your glove off. Uh, 
you, what you do is you remove one, you put the thumb under the glove, pour that up, right? I, I don't have any gloves to show you, but you pour that glove up, ball it in this glove, and this hand that still had that glove on, and use this thumb to pull up underneath, right? That glove off and it folds in and you got both gloves with the exposed area in that other glove and just throw it away, get in the car and be on your way home. So um, you just wanna be careful. Again, wash your hands for 30 seconds. Your hands are like little cars that pick up and drop off germs, right? Uh, the most important thing you can do is wash your hands for 30 seconds before touching near your access. And anyone else, don't let no doctor or nurse practitioner or staff say, oh, let me see your access and touch it with their bare hands without uh, cause you know, you may have some staff, if you go and, and it's their first time sticking you, right? It's, it's their first time sticking you and they may want to touch your access with no gloves on being quick at the draw, you know, no, tell them, no, don't, don't, t you know, if you got to snatch your arm back, snatch it back. It's like, no, wash your hands before you touch my arm, right? Um, it takes 30 seconds of washing to get rid of all the germs you picked up. Please, guys, share this broadcast. And I, I, I beg you, I don't want to use that word, but I, I use it uh, intentionally. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, even if you don't go and watch the video, because you just do it for me. Uh, so we can build up our um, followers list. That's all I'm asking. God bless you on that. Um, so look, let's continue. Infection prevention differs depending on your access. So again, infection prevention differs depending on your access. So let's say if you have a catheter, right? Because we know some warriors may have to have a catheter. They may not uh, uh, be uh, a candidate for a fistula or a graft because of small veins or, or whatever the case may be. So they may have to use a catheter, right? So when you have a catheter, you are at much higher higher risk of infection than with a permanent access. I didn't, it didn't say that you're going to get an infection, but you're at higher risk. So you're going to have to do things, mindful things to lower that risk, right? If you want to keep that catheter in working condition and not um, get hit with infection, so the care team is supposed to, right? They're supposed to help you understand how to move to a permanent dialysis access. But again, if, if, if you can't get it, you can't get it. But if you can, then you, you definitely need to be mindful of that you're at risk for an uh, infection. So the sooner you get that removed and get that uh, permanent access put in the better. Uh, germ. Now check this out. Germs like wet, warm, dark, and dirty places. Right. If your catheter bandage gets wet or dirty, it can give germs a free home to hide and multiply. Now check this out. Honestly. I've seen warriors in the summertime come to dialysis because it sweats so much that the dressing, they came to dialysis with no dressing on. I'm like, are you kidding me? If that's the case, go, go to the unit, do something. Let me give you some extra 
island dressings or have some dressings at home. But if that dressing comes off, don't walk around and continue to dress and put a uh, powder or spray perfume or lotion because, man, you're setting yourself up for an infection, a bloodstream infection, right? If your bandage happens to get wet or dirty, again, let the dialysis team know this. Call their asses. Even if it's not on your dialysis day, call them and tell them what happened. And they're more than welcome to uh, you go down there and get a bandage. That's better than getting an infection because these clinics don't want you to get an infection because it makes them look bad, right? It makes them look bad. And then they won't get paid by Medicare. You know, they'll change it for you. Now, when you talk about the graft or fistula, again, germs are everywhere and they want to travel. You don't want to be the taxi cab for your germs to get into your fistula or your graft. Any surface you touch with your hands or body carry germs, right? If you touch a surface with your access, wash it for 30 seconds with antibacterial soap as soon as you can. You better believe it. Always wash your access just before your dialysis treatment. And then again, just after dialysis. Absolutely. Get the germs off. You got staff putting that tape on you, wrapping you up. The gloves may have blood on it. I mean, it's just so much going on and so much germs. You want to minimize your risk of getting a blood-borne infection, also a wound infection. 